It was in the late 40s and early 50s that the people of Arkansas, like most Americans in those post-war years, were full of hope. And as the economy shifted from a military emphasis to one that was consumer-driven, the feeling was anything was possible. It was in this northwest Arkansas community of Bentonville that Sam and Helen Walton purchased Luther Harrison's variety store and demonstrated their confidence in the future and in the people of this area. It was 1950, and they opened the first Walton 5 and 10, a Ben Franklin franchise with the Walton name. Sam had purchased the Bentonville store after operating this Ben Franklin franchise in Newport, Arkansas. He and Helen had been there for five years, and they were quite successful. So successful, in fact, that the man who leased it to them wanted it back. During the same time, Bud Walton had opened his own Ben Franklin in Versailles, Missouri. By 1959, Bud, Sam, and their families owned nine franchise stores. In 1962, after becoming Ben Franklin's largest franchisee, Sam opened his first large discount store under the Walmart name in Rogers, Arkansas. It was less than one-fifth the size of today's average Walmart and had only 25 employees. Its volume and promising future led Sam to make a trip to the Ben Franklin offices in Chicago. He went there with an idea. Don Soderquist, then a data processing officer for Ben Franklin, recalls Sam's visit. His purpose was to share with him, them this idea that he had of taking a discount store and putting it in a small rural community. He said, I've already opened a store in Rogers, Arkansas that I would consider a discount store. And I'm convinced that there's a lot more business in those smaller communities than what most people believe. So I would like you to consider selling me merchandise for a discount store at a lower price so that we can together uh, try this new venture of serving the rural communities with discount stores. Well, after a morning of discussion, they told him they just really didn't see a future. And, and besides that, they couldn't offer him merchandise at a lower price than what they were selling to the Ben Franklin franchisees. Undeterred, Sam continued to pursue his vision. And two years later, in 1964, he opened his second Walmart in Harrison, Arkansas. It was anything but a smooth opening. Here's how David Glass, then president of a drug retailing chain, remembers the store upon his first visit. Uh, when I saw the Harrison, Arkansas store, uh, I, I thought to myself, this is, this is absolutely the worst discount store or retail store that I've ever seen. Uh, Sam bought a couple of truckloads of watermelons and he'd stacked them up across the front of the store. Uh, he had donkey rides for the kids out on the parking lot and what he didn't anticipate is that the temperature was about 110 degrees in Harrison that day and the watermelons began to pop and that watermelon juice began to run all over the parking lot and uh, the donkeys did what donkeys do. And, uh, and sort of tracked through all that. You can imagine what it looked like. The thing I didn't realize about Sam, though, and the people who were involved in those early days in Walmart is that they had a quality that I haven't seen in many people or in many companies. And that was that there was never a day went by that they didn't improve something. And improve Walmart did. Within another five years, Sam and his associates had proved the doubters wrong. A discounter who truly offered the consumer the assurance of low prices every day could be profitable in rural America. The 70s can be called the decade of growth. In 1972, Walmart was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. This initial 100 share certificate would, after eight two-for-one splits, represent at the end of 1989, 25,600 shares, worth well over $1 million. The 70s saw Walmart grow in many ways, from its first 60,000 square foot distribution center in Bentonville to four centers with combined space of one and a half million square feet. And 3,500 employees at that time became associates, sharing in one of the most generous profit-sharing plans in American business. And capping the decade, a milestone was reached in 1979 with the celebration of Walmart's first billion-dollar year. 
The 80s ushered in a new accelerated era of expansion for Walmart. With the purchase of 91 big K stores located primarily in the southeast, Walmart took a major step in becoming a national discounter. And in 1984, when Walmart achieved a record 8% pre-tax profit, Sam Walton made good on his promise to associates and performed a hula on Wall Street. The 80s were also a decade characterized by new concepts, bold innovations, and the use of new technology, and above all, a desire to experiment. In 1987, the company completed the largest private satellite communication system in the U.S., which linked all operating units of the company with the general office. In 1983, the highly successful Sam's Wholesale Club was developed, a no-frills, members-only, cash-and-carry wholesale club. In 1987, in Garland, Texas, Walmart opened its first combination grocery and general merchandise store, Hypermart USA. Walmart has succeeded by creating a climate where associates are encouraged to be their best. The Saturday morning meetings, a tradition that began in the early Ben Franklin days, continue to rally support for new ways of doing things. Ideas flow upward from the associates and managers to those at the general office. And positive reinforcement is always the rule. With each passing year in its history, Walmart, perhaps like no other company, has undergone dramatic change. The 90s were no exception. Always open to innovation, the company continued to experiment with new ideas. And in doing so, Walmart became the nation's top retailer, surpassing even Sears, and was recognized as an icon of American ingenuity. On March 17, 1992, then President Bush traveled to Walmart headquarters in Bentonville and awarded Sam Walton the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Though weak with cancer, Sam proudly stood and accepted the award. For the humble founder of the world's leading retail enterprise, it was a momentous occasion. He had less than a month to enjoy the honor. On April 5, 1992, Sam passed away at age 74. He left an indelible impression on those who worked with him. Though many predicted the loss of its charismatic leader would have a devastating effect on the company, Walmart once again proved the critics wrong. Eldest son Rob Walton became chairman of the board, and David Glass continued on as CEO. And in the years that followed, the retailer witnessed its greatest growth yet. In 1991, Walmart became an international company with the opening of a store in Mexico City. The operation was a joint venture with Cifra, now called Walmart de Mexico. In the years following that first across-the-border endeavor, the company took its everyday low prices concept around the globe, and Walmart International was created. Walmart can now be found in more than 1,200 international locations. While Walmart was expanding around the globe, it was also pursuing new endeavors at home. The company tested a new concept, the first supermarket and a Walmart store all in one. This new store became known as the Walmart Supercenter. The concept took off and in a few short years, Supercenters became the key to the company's growth. Supercenter shoppers enjoy fresh produce, meat, seafood, and deli items as well as canned goods and general merchandise in one convenient shopping venue. Walmart developed supercenters around the country and internationally, and in 2001 celebrated the opening of its 1,000th domestic supercenter. In 1990, Walmart discovered another opportunity to drive costs even lower by handling the supply of groceries to its supercenters. With the development of its own distribution centers, Walmart was able to order in larger quantities at